Okay, let's start out. Um, I want to re-describe the thing I was saying about one-sided testing before we go into controversies concerning sharp testing. So in the one-sided case, um, we are looking at this. So I think I said H naught, and I say it like this, theta is greater or equal to theta naught. In H1, theta is less than theta naught. This is specifically what you're testing. Now, in the p-value world, you have to plug in the null. So it's always the more extremity of data um, given the null hypothesis. So you always take the boundary of this point, this set, because it's the most powerful thing to do. Um, if you don't understand what you're doing with p-values and you don't understand what they guarantee, I'm going to say stop using them. Don't report them if you don't know what you're doing with them. And that's the vast majority. And that should probably be true no matter what you're doing. So I don't mean to be overly didactic about all of this, you know, but it's like if you don't know what you're doing with a chainsaw, don't use it. You know? <laughs> so you're going to kill yourself or somebody else. If you don't know what you're doing with p-values and you're doing something that's health-related, probably just stop because it's there's a similar analogy. I think. Um, there's been a lot of discussion on p-values, and we're going to walk through this real quick, and I'm going to offer you an easy extra credit assignment as well at the end of this. Um, but I want to describe in one-sided testing, there's agreement. So Bayesians and non-Bayesians are in close agreement. And so we saw this last time. I don't know if I described it all that well. In sharp testing, H naught theta is equal to theta naught versus H1, theta is not equal to theta naught, um, there's very little agreement. And I would say two no agreement. I find this fascinating in itself. You know, if I change something a little bit and I think that, well, maybe both paradigms are rational, and I see some wild disagreement, make sure you really start thinking about the question a lot harder. We've talked about the validity of this question and what we might really mean, but Bayesians and non-Bayesians mean something entirely different in testing this. So this correspondence right here, let me just redraw this for you. I went through the Bayes factor argument for computing the posterior probability. You can verify that what I'm about to show you is exactly the same thing. So for testing this, uh, you could do the p-value thing. And the p-value thing looks like this. So what you're going to do is you're going to form your null distribution. So that looks like this right here. And again, let's just do it make our example is xi's come from a normal distribution with mean theta variance sigma squared. So i goes from 1 to n. And I'll just make a note. Note, x bar is sufficient And so we can just use x bar. But if you if you built up the likelihood function, you would realize that the likelihood function only depends on x i through x bar. And that's what I mean. It's it's sufficient. So I could just do the compression right here. So a p-value thing is they're going to form this distribution. I'm going to form it on x bar, and I'm going to plug in this thing at the boundary right here, theta naught. This is all stack one on one. This is like the problem that would just, it was really annoying me that we do this so much in stat 101 classes. So they're indoctrinating you with the procedure, usually not telling you what it is. Um, they kind of appeal to your intuition. In a grad statistics class, they're going to talk about power 
the uniformly most powerful tests. Maybe you know something about that. Uh, this distribution is going to be centered at theta naught, right here. Just for the record, this thing is a normal distribution centered at theta naught, and it's going to have variance sigma squared over a. That's the null distribution. And let's um, just talk about where x bar could live, right here. So if I were testing this, if x bar was over here, would that be in support of the null or in support of the alternative? In the null. Yeah, exactly. So x bar is over on this side because x bar is an estimator of theta itself. So if x bar is over here, we start to think theta is over here. Theta is greater than theta naught. And so this is support for the null. The more support, for h naught if x bar is over here. So let's just imagine we saw this x bar right here. So I'm just drawing a picture. Let's say that's what we saw. That's where x bar lit right here. And what you usually do in stats classes is you usually end up standardizing everything so you're going to have um, your transformation z is equal to x bar minus the null hypothesis over sigma squared over n. So if the null were true, then this thing right here has mean theta naught because the null would be true. So the expectation of x bar is theta, and if theta, if the null is true, then you know, we're going to be plugging in theta naught right there, divided by that um, standard deviation right here. I should get rid of that and put over square root of n. So I make mistakes sometimes. So that's the um, standardized score. So I subtract off the mean, it's centered at zero, and I divide by its scale factor, and it turns the variance and the standard error into one. And say, so you don't have to do this. But it's very common that people will change this distribution. This thing right here has variance sigma squared divided by n. When I divide this thing by that, it turns the scale into 1 and the center into 0 right here. This thing is over to the right of this, so this value is going to be over to the right, right there. And so what a p-value is, is it's measuring the more extremity under the null hypothesis. How extreme is this? And so where's the p-value? Is it, so I'll draw the threshold. So the more extremity is either on this side or it's on that side. And you have to think about the context of the problem. And so what I used to do in, when I was taking step 101 and none of this made any sense to me, I was like, I just need to get this right. This is idea pushing towards a contradiction. If I push this farther and farther over here, that would be more support in the null hypothesis. And the p-value should go up. If the p-value was a measure of support of the null, and in the one-sided case, it's not. In the sharp case, or so, sorry, in the one-sided case, it is a measure of support. In the two-sided case, it's not. So we'll be studying that. So the p-value is this direction, right here. So that's the p-value. Okay. So I tried to draw something like that for you last time. Just going through it really quickly. So where's the p-value over here? It's the same thing. It's this area. You don't have to standardize. There's no reason you need to do that. You could work with this distribution, and this area right here is equivalent to that. So I've just done this one-to-one -one transformation of everything. Why do people do the standardization? Patrick? Isn't it because there's an easier to use formula for the CDF? They're equivalent to each other. So I would say the formula, the CDF, you can't write it down in closed form. Okay. So in either case, you can't do it. So, but you're getting somewhere. So, yeah, it's because you made tables back in the days. So it's like you want to set something up that it's like adaptable to any problem. So it's all about tables and tabling stuff. And so, what could you actually write down a table for? Um, I will point out for the t-test, if you have, if you're doing paired comparisons. 
that normal approximation, that T approximation, is not correct. And the reason they use it is because they couldn't table the correct thing, because it requires four parameters, and tabling something with four parameters. So this is really just uh, way back when things were harder to do because we didn't have computers. So just for tables, but it's the same thing. Here's what the Bayesian does for the one-sided test. So phase, again, this is one-sided. As I walk you through and compute the Bayes factor, you could do that, but you could compute just the posterior probability directly. So what the Bayesian does is they're going to form the posterior distribution on theta given x bar. Where is this distribution center? Here, I'll just remind us that our prior is going to be pi theta proportional to 1, in case you think I'm tricking you or something. So the same example as last time. Where is that distribution center? X bar. X bar. Where was theta not in my picture? I had drawn it, I had drawn it to the left, so it's still to the left. So it's like over here, theta naught. Where's the posterior probability that we're computing? If we're computing this right here, sorry, for this one, we're just going to integrate over this range. So that Bayes factor calculation and converting it into a posterior probability is equivalent to just integrating over this range right here. Keep in mind, we've kind of flipped the direction of everything in the Bayesian analysis. But this right here is just going to be the integral from theta naught to infinity of our posterior distribution, x bar, d theta. This thing right here is just being normal, centered at x bar, variant sigma squared over. And you can convince yourself, maybe tonight, maybe you already have, that this area right here is that exact same area over there. And so they're the exact same thing. So this is going to be the posterior probability. So this is the probability of H0 given X bar. So you just integrate over the posterior in that direction. I'll just remind you that for p-value testing, if you want to know which direction you're integrating over, you chase the alternative direction. This is less than so you integrate to the left. So that's the easy way to remember it is you chase your alternative direction for the p-value. That's true for all p-values. And if you don't know that, you should go refresh your memory on what they taught you in Stout 101. Because they did this to you over and over and over again. Okay, so different interpretations to everything, but this is a pretty easy calculation for a Bayesian, and it turns out we agree with each other if we have the same sort of prior involved in all of this. So that's my posterior function. Uh, that's cool. I like that. So that's that correspondence. The Bayesian and the non-Bayesian are going to give you the same number, but they're interpreting it differently. And so the Bayesian is saying this is a measure on the null hypothesis. They've been explicit by applying Bayes' theorem to coming up with a random variable. This, again, is just um, theta is going to be greater or equal to theta naught. So I'm just integrating over that range, which is defining those boundaries. This is an entirely different game over here, even though you get the same numbers. The idea is, is that if the p-value ducks your alpha level, and maybe you pick that to be 5%, if you ended up rejecting the null, you would be wrong 5% of the time. So it's actually alpha is what's calibrating your error rate, and you're supposed to come up with that up front. And if you play this hypothetical game, well, if I had an alpha that was this, then I would interpret it like that. That is not valid. You're supposed to do this before you. And so that's kind of the problem that Fisher had, is he didn't like reporting the alpha level. He wanted to interpret P as a measure for the null hypothesis. Now, these numbers wind up to be exactly the same thing, and the Bayesian is explicitly placing the measure on the null hypothesis, 
where the non-Bayesian is placing the measure not on theta naught or theta itself, but on x bar and using that as a proxy for a measure. And it turns out it is a proxy because they're exactly the same numbers. It turns out all of that collapses under sharp testing. So lots of weird issues, but you might just consider the question at hand in the first place. Is that really what you want to ask? Um, hopefully that makes some sense to you. I want to take a moment to look at um, Ron Wasserstein's talk that he gave about a week and a half ago here at Virginia Tech. It's, it was a virtual thing. And I'm going to send you the link to this so that you can watch it. There's questions and answers at the end, and I like the Q&A session, although I will say that it, it's pretty weak. You know, the answers, it's like, well, you do everything, you know? And then you, maybe that's evidence for more investigation. Ah, so, he doesn't do a good job of distinguishing sharp testing from one-sided testing, and I think that's where there's a fundamental breakdown, is that um, people don't understand the nuanced differences between these two hypotheses. But here's this thing, you'll need your um, BT login to access the link that I'll send to you. So I don't know why they protected it, but I guess only BT people can see this. Just don't see why we don't. Oops, I need volume. To let everybody hear what we're talking about. Probably not, but it's it's one of my favorite cars because of my great attachment to that uh, movie, which is now 
shockingly, almost 40 years old. But again, this little thought experiment involves us having the um, uh, imagining a car that has really remarkable properties. For example, it's uh, absolutely beautiful to look at. Um, sorry, I've got to change my view so I can make sure I can see what I'm talking about. There we go. Um, it violates the laws of physics by running for three days on a rechargeable nine volt battery that you can recharge in an hour. You don't need Doc Brown's 1.21 gigawatts to get the flux capacitor going. It's, it's cheap. Everyone can afford one, and there's plenty of them. Everybody has access to it. But it has a, uh, it has a small problem. It turns out to be difficult to drive. Hold up for a minute so somebody can get muted here. Okay, excellent. It turns out that this beautiful, inexpensive, highly efficient car is gets involved in crashes all the time because it's it's just really difficult to drive. Well, the analogy I'm making here is that I'm going to invite you during this talk to consider what I'm calling the 100-year test drive of statistical significance, a concept that made its way to the fore in, uh, in Fisher's uh, famous book, Statistical Methods for Research Workers, in 1925. And it's had problems, and there have been concerns about it, for about as long as it's been around. Uh, here's a paper uh, from none other than David Cox, Sir David Cox, and he wrote in this paper that it's been widely felt, probably for 30 years and more, that significant tests are overemphasized and often misused, and that more emphasis should be placed on estimation and prediction. Cox wrote those words in 1986, referring back 30 years, so I'll fess up that 1956 was in fact the year of my birth. So at least for my entire lifetime, this discussion has been going on. It's, um, you might think in some respects, my, of my talk as being uh, a cover uh, of, uh, of an old song, but it's a, uh, it's a song that still uh, needs to be sung. There's uh, Fred Mosteller, who always had a way with words, wrote that the main purpose of a significance test is to inhibit the natural enthusiasm of the investigator. Uh, in this wonderful paper by um, Cherry Clark, who was a, a leader in um, uh, statistics uh, many years ago, um, she wrote, in part, that significance tests do not provide the information that scientists need, and furthermore, they are not the most effective method for analyzing and summarizing data. In 1963, we're talking about here, I was worried about, I don't know, second grade then. In this wonderfully titled article, uh, The Earth is Round, B less than 0.05, Jacob Cohen wrote, what's wrong with null hypothesis significance testing? Well, among many other things, it does not tell us what we want to know. And we so much want what we want to know that out of desperation, we nevertheless believe that it does. For a long time, people have said, well, the problem really isn't with significance testing. The problem is with how people use it, that they're not trained properly. But if we'll stick with the, the car analogy a little bit longer, at some point we have to realize that it, driver's education is not the problem. In fact, um, in a recent article by Ray Hubbard in a publication that I'll say more about a little bit later in this talk, he takes a look at the, um, the relationship, as it were, between the number of citations of articles that criticize significance testing or warn about the dangers of it. He shows that that has grown, uh, uh, those citations have grown substantially over the years, so that part of it is more and more often people are saying, watch out for this, don't do this, avoid this, and yet at the same time, the percentage of papers in many disciplines that use it has also considerably increased. So it doesn't seem like more and more driver's education is helping. Okay, so we got off to uh, a flying or maybe a racing start is a better way to say it, but 
Let's back up a moment. Okay. I, don't, I don't know the backgrounds of everybody on, on this call, so let's just make sure that we're on the same page by talking through very briefly what a p-value is, because that will be core to this discussion of statistical significance. So in the ASA statement on statistical significance and p-values that I will uh, mention a little bit later in this presentation, he tried to write a nice informal definition, this one. Informally, a p-value is the probability under a specified statistical model that a statistical summary of the data, that might be the sample mean difference between two groups, would be equal to or more extreme than its observed value. Okay, it's an informal definition. We thought that was a nice, clear informal definition, but the press disagreed with that assessment. And now, we could have gone the other way and gone for the the strictly technical definition, <laughs> excuse me, but the, uh, I, and I imagine there are a few of you in the audience that are into measure theory and would like this one just fine, but for most of us, it's not that helpful. So I'm not going to try to define a p-value, but I think it's just perfectly fine for this purpose and many purposes just to describe what it is. So let's start with the basics. We're investigators. We know the thing. Okay, a p-value is given the null hypothesis, the probability of your data and more extreme data. You have to define the direction of more extremity through the alternative. And in a lot of cases, that's, it's not natural what that would mean. So in like ordered sets like this, or a one-sided hypothesis, we understand it, what more extremity means. But in things that aren't ordered in the first place, Let's say you are trying to like come up with um, the probability of, or you're trying to explain the genealogical past of everybody in this room through our genomes. So there's a bifurcating tree that maybe describes that well, depending on which genes we're studying, and what is a more extreme bifurcating tree look like? I have no idea. <laughs> you know, so. You know, it's, it's hard to describe it in like topological structures or multimodal spaces, what a more extremity will look like. Um, I'm going to leave this as an extra credit problem. So if you continue to watch this video, I'll post it to Slack for us. You'll need your BT login. Um, and you write me up a two page just discussion of p values and what the debates are, and outline some of the debate and maybe provide me with your opinion for one paragraph, I'll give you 10% of interim credit. So that's pretty generous. Um, so um, extra credit. And I'm only going to say it here. So if you're not watching the lectures, you don't know about it. So extra credit. Um, watch Wasserstein's video. Did anybody catch who he is? So he's the executive whatever of the American Statistical Association. So he used to be the president, one of the presidents. They, you know, every year or so, there's a new president. So he's an administrator, is what it means. But he's trying to, to weigh in, and he's given a, he does give a pretty nice talk. And I, I will say my favorite part of his talk is the discussion of Bayes at the end in the Q&A session. It's pretty weak probably why it's my favorite. It's like, it's so lacking. So there's so much more to say right there. Uh, my second favorite part is how compelling he is in giving this talk. And he gives you, and this comes up in about five minutes, he says, okay, I'm gonna give you the whole, like, wait for it. This is my big punchline on why I have come to Virginia Tech to give this great, important information. And I'm gonna be super compelling right now. He said, I did some calculation and the p-value was 0.03. That's amazing, right? The p-value is 0.03. Whoa! Like, it does not answer any important question. It's like, what, what is more extremity mean to you? How did you come up with that? What the heck are you talking about? P is less than 0.03. If people want a p-value that's less than 0.05, I've got a whole bunch of them for you. So I've got lots of them, try to get them when they're hot. You know, once I give them all away, I don't have any more to give out. It's not going to be Okay. So watch Wasserstein's talk and give me 
a two-page discussion on um, pros and cons of p-values. He, he's got this really good one. You know, I'll, I'll just give you this one as a freebie. We don't have time to listen to all of Ron's stuff right now. But there was a study that was done. I wasn't aware of this until he had pointed it out, but I guess I've heard of this. There was a study that was done that measures, I guess, testosterone and cortisol levels, depending on how you posture yourself. So I guess if you're feeling like you're the boss, you know, your levels are going to be high. And if you're the minion, your levels are going to be low. And so um, some sociologists, I guess, tried to test some of this, if you could control it. And we probably all heard, like, you know, if you want to, you want to present yourself, you want a power pose, you know? So you walk in and, you know, it's, uh, you know, big versus the, you know, that sort of thing, like, don't hurt. And so they looked at uh, a bunch of different people, and they had them power pose or do the non-power pose. And they had measured their cortisol levels, and their testosterone levels. And they ended up reporting, based off of statistical significance, that there were differences between the groups. And so these different ways people pose showed different levels in the way that they had hoped to see. And that's great. So that makes us inclined to power pose. Maybe that'll jack us up a little bit and we'll be able to be more powerful and we'll be the boss. So I don't know if it's true. Um, the reproducibility on that study is awful. So people have gone in, tried to verify it, and they noticed that there are differences in the groups. But it's not in the directions they say. But there are differences that lead to small p-values. So they got a p-value of 0.03 or whatever. Compelling, there's differences between the groups, and that's what I'm going to explain to you. And it's pointed out by a lot of people, humans are inherently noisy. And there's differences for all kinds of reasons. And it's not necessarily attributed to the null hypothesis. It could be that your modeling assumptions are flawed. So you might say, hey, let's just you know, treat this all as normal. And we get low p-values because we've used the wrong modeling distribution. And so and it's not the null hypothesis that we're rejecting that all the groups are the same, but rather our statistical model and framework altogether. So humans are noisy, they lead to small key values in general, there's differences. It's more important to describe those differences. But what I want you to do is go through this, watch it, and then write up a two-page discussion, and give me your opinion. Okay. Patrick, you got the question ready? What? I know what it is. Have you got your question? No. I got Patrick's question. What does it do? <laughs> <laughs> so when do I turn this in? You can turn this in by the end of class, the last day of class. So you can turn in all the extra credit that I'll continue to give you. But it's not good enough for me that you know how to compute a p-value. It means nothing to me. I want to know if you understand it and know how to use it and when you would use it and what does it mean. So, uh, by last day of class. And I'll say this is up to 10% midterm credit. So if you do a reasonable job, watch this thing, take some notes, write something up, it's easy to read through, I'll give you the 10%. So if it's like, scribbles and I can't read it, I don't know what you said, and it doesn't mirror the thing that I watched, I'll give you less. Daniel? So like last day of lecture, you want hard copy, I'm assuming? Yeah. Okay. yeah, just come in and turn it in. If you are quarantining, then send it over. Oh. Yes, please. When does this correspond to the I mean, in terms of the whole Of the entire class? 
So look at the, the breakdown of the midterm. How much credit is there on the midterm on the syllabus? So look at that and I'll let you do the multiplication. So it's on there. So I don't remember, so I don't want to misstate. I don't know. I think it could have been like, I don't remember. So it's whatever it is. Okay. Um, so watch through that. All this qualitative stuff is really important. Let's do a little bit more discussion on p-values themselves versus phase factors. So let's go to the sharp testing thing. I don't think Ron does an incredible job of highlighting the difference between the different types of p-values for different types of tests and where the arguments really incur. Um, so that might be one of your pros cons or something like that. So. Let's just consider the example. Again, same example. X's come from a normal distribution with mean theta and variant sigma squared. I go from one to n. And we're gonna test this. Theta is equal to theta naught versus theta is something different. So what is the, the Bayesian do? I'll just say, if you wanted to use a continuous prior on this, so if you used your conjugate prior, you would come up with that same posterior right here, and then we would integrate it over the null set. And that would give you zero. So, because there's no mass at that point. And so if you're looking for things that you can, methods you can reject, there's an auto procedure. Use the totally incorrect prior. And the reason that gives you zero mass on the null hypothesis is your prior puts zero mass on the null hypothesis. So if I had a zero times the likelihood, I'll never be able to like my likelihood my way out of that. I'm always stuck. So we use the point mass prior that places mass on the null hypothesis and it places mass elsewhere. So we have to have some positive mass on the null in the prior if the posterior is gonna give you positive mass as well. Um, that's an auto procedure for coming up with low posterior probability, use a continuous prior. Uh, if you want an auto procedure for a low p-value, does anybody know what it is? If you want a small p-value, I can tell you how to get one, even if the hypothesis is true and the model is correct. Increase sample size. Increase sample size. Keep increasing sample size until you get there. Keep in mind the p-value under the null hypothesis, you're going to prove this on your homework, is uniformly distributed. So if I'm just drawing a uniform random number, what's the probability that I'm going to pick one that's less than 5%? 5% 5, 5 of the time I'll do it. So eventually you'll get there. Just keep doing it and you'll get zero. And I've seen that happen a lot of times. So those aren't real prescriptions. It's certainly not science. Okay, so if we want to test this, we need to compute the base factor. We've already described this pretty well. And so this is just going to look like this. E to the minus one half. This is going to be, um, write it down like this, x bar minus theta squared over sigma squared over n times my point mass prior. That's pi on h naught, my continuous prior. But it's only still continuous, this function right here, but it only takes on one when that's true and zero otherwise. A pretty easy integral to do. I should also integrate just over the null set. And then we're going to integrate over the alternative prior. We'll compare these things to each other. So e to the minus one half, x bar minus theta squared, sigma squared over n, and this is going to be whatever this prior is, p, h1, theta, maybe I'll call it pi, 
try to stay consistent. In this thing, we ended up at least advocating that we would use 1 over square root 2 pi psi e to the minus 1 half theta minus, what did we pick for this? Theta h1 squared over psi squared right here. So this right here is just a normal center you know, wherever you want to put this thing, psi squared right here. And we ended up advocating because of symmetry and for all kinds of other reasons that we're going to take that thing and we're going to plug in theta naught right there. So that's how we would center it. And we have big questions about how we place this right here. We do that in a roll. I'll just point out right here that this is the margin of the depth under the alternative hypothesis. So that's fx bar right here. Keep in mind this integral right here is integral fx bar given theta, pi theta given theta naught, psi squared d theta. So I'm integrating over theta and I'm just getting the marginal distribution of the data. This is going to be the margin under the null. And so we already know what this is right here. This is only positive. This is only um, has non-zero mass when that is true right there. So we're just plugging in theta naught into our equation. So this right here, I want to know the distribution of x bar. And so x bar I can write like this. I would like you to know how to do this integral in its full blown glory. I'm not going to do it right now. So, but if you're ever struggling with it, review session is a good time to talk about that integral. So you're going to complete the square and do all that stuff. Here's a trick that you might use. X bar minus theta plus theta. That's true. Right? What's that? The x bar? Oh, sorry. Yeah. That's true. Okay. So, um, I want to know the distribution of this thing. So I can study the right hand side and know the distribution of this. This is my three second trick that you'll never forget what this integral is. You'll be able to do this all the time. Save yourself some time. What's the distribution of this? Right here, x bar minus theta. Theta is the truth. So the expectation of x bar is theta. So what's the expectation of this creature? It's a normal. OK, yeah, so this is normal. This has expectation theta. That's theta right there. So this is going to have expectation 0. What's the variance? That's it. Plus, what's this thing right here? That's the marginal distribution of theta, aka the contribution through the prime. So how is this distributed? It's normally distributed. We picked it that. It's going to be centered at theta naught. We have variance psi squared right here. So this thing right here is a normal. I add together the means. I add together the variance. So this is going to be theta naught psi squared plus sigma squared over n, as promised from last time. Again, I want you to know how to do the integral, so that if you get into more complicated problems, you know how to handle it. But that should save you some time. I want to just write down what this base factor is. I made a note of it. Once we end up doing all the calculation. And next time we'll pick up with this. After I do all this calculation and I plug in these two different normal distributions right here, so this is just going to be this function right here in the numerator where I plug in theta naught, and then I'm going to write down the marginal distribution for x bar. I'm going to take the ratio of them. This base factor at the end of the day looks like this. And I don't know this off the top of my head. This is multiplication, so I make a note. But this would take a couple of lines of algebra. 
one half. You'll notice that the two pies and stuff cancel for both the, everything is already canceled. I didn't even write them down. This will look like e to the minus one half x bar minus theta naught over sigma squared over n. This is going to be squared right here. And this is going to be times something. So 1 plus sigma squared over n psi squared inverse. So at the end of the day, once you do all of this, you can write it like that. And you can verify that to yourself. So this is just the ratio of two normals right here that you're going to be writing down. And it simplifies to that after a couple lines of arithmetic. And so what I want you to notice is that this thing right here is z squared. So this is x bar minus theta naught over sigma over root n, z right here squared. So there's some correspondence between this and the p-value. So the p-value itself only depends on this thing right here. So imagine for a second, this was 1.97. Okay, so we're doing the sharp test. So what would we do if we saw this thing being 1.97? What do they teach you in STAT 101? Where's the critical threshold? 196. So it's bigger than that, it's more extreme. So this is strong evidence to reject, right? We're going to discuss that next time and see what the relationship is. But this obviously has a lot to do with other terms, namely what is n and also what is psi squared. So be thinking about this with respect to what c squared and what would a class assist in. We'll pick up with that next time. So sorry for running over you guys. I thought it was at least worth listening to what Ron has to say. Patrick, last question. The one plus sigma squared, that's in the exponent, right? This is in the exponent, yeah. yeah. Yes, it's in the exponent. So it's multiplying into that thing. Okay. Think about this equation. We'll pick up with that next time. Lots of discussion. Lots of things to understand through this relationship. Thanks, you guys.